from Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. With workplace mental health becoming a safety prerogative, this is the source of information on psychological injury prevention and health promotion. Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joel Mitchell. How are you today, Joel? Oh, I'm full of vitamin D from the brand new window that that I have right, are, in, right in front of my desk. You are glowing. I am glowing. Yeah, I've, I'm going to be tan in no time. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're in the new office. Hooray. You've got your massive window. I do. I do. Yeah. You still have your desk, buddy? For now. For now. <laughs> <laughs> Until you tell Steve to go somewhere else because there's lots of other workstations. There is. There. Yeah, there's lots of other work. Well, he's he's going to, once he, he employs his couple of people, they're going to um, shift yeah. over to their own um, their own pod. Yeah. Um, I do have Jason right over the partition from me, which is... Um, not great for focused work, probably. No, no, no. The the chief distraction officer um, likes to perform his function. Yeah, and um, it's not good when, uh, I guess, I'm trying to procrastinate and you keep telling me that you need stuff from me. Yeah. Um, it's really, like, biting into my uh, my procrastination time. I don't think it is, though, because you're still procrastinating. Uh, I know, I'm putting a downer on it. I'll give you that. Yeah, uh, look... Uh, I've been practicing my whole life mm. um, to procrastinate, so um, yeah. it's an inbuilt skill. Yeah. It takes a while to break that. I'm, I'm doing my best to break you, Jason. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to doing some work for you this afternoon after this podcast. I'm also looking forward to you doing some work for me this afternoon after this podcast, seeing as you're about to leave for a few weeks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the office will be a hive of productivity while you're gone. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to come back and see, you know, how many world problems that we've solved. I reckon the team might have cured cancer by that time. I think at least three world problems we will have solved by the time you get home, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good, yeah. Mm. Anyway, um, we've got a guest waiting for us who is also solving a real-world problem. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we'll good segue. Invite, invite him in. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, he is a psychologist. We like having psychologists on. We sure do. With professional practice across a range of industries, including mining, oil and gas, construction, corrections, and law enforcement. His current role is focused on mental health and psychosocial risk management in the West Australian mining industry as Inspector of Mines, Mental Health and Wellbeing at the Western Australian Department of Mines, Industry Regulation and Safety. Welcome to the podcast, Bryce Ridgeway. Thank you very much. Nice to be on. Yeah, great to have you on, mate. We've been wanting someone from Demers on this for the longest of times, um, particularly because we're local, right? And uh, we've had uh, regulators from Victoria on, South Australia on, New South Wales. Takes a while to get our uh, people in our own backyard on, on the podcast. Well, that that's not Bryce's fault. It's not Bryce's fault. No, no, no. <laughs> um, but but we've got some fairly recent news um, out of Demons um, that we, c we can share and really looking forward to getting into it with you today. Yeah, absolutely. So before we do get into that, Bryce, what podcast do you like to listen to? Um, I think sadly my podcast listening game has dropped off a little bit recently. So uh, I I'm not doing as much podcast listening as I used to, but I think when I do, it tends to be not so much work focused. So uh, they've got a few favourites in there, like uh, Five of My Life. I'm a, a fan of, quite like that. And um, I've got another few uh, ones like the uh, the Business Wars podcast and uh, How I, I Built it. This, um, which sort of takes care of the management business nerd in me as well. Yeah. Two of my favourites, those two. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, now, tell us about your professional career. Yeah, so, well, as you noted, I'm a psychologist, so I've probably been quite fortunate, actually, in my career. I've um, been able to bounce around a couple of different industries, sort of through a, a few different roles as well, which has uh, been quite interesting. So I think... Uh, after I finished my studies, I travelled around a little bit, as you do, and ended up in the Northern Territory for a while and spent a couple of years working for, well, at the time it was customs in the, the current language, it would be Border Force. So interesting role, absolutely nothing to do with psychology, mind you, but uh, really good foundation experience in working for a regulator, investigation processes, interpreting legislation, those sorts of things. 
Um, and then from there went into psychology focused roles. So did my registration with Department of Justice here in WA. So spent quite a few years working in corrections, primarily uh, working in rehabilitation assessment of sexual offenders. Um, did that for a yeah, number of years before then moving more into a mining oil and gas space. Um, so again, working predominantly as a psychologist, delivering consultancy training, culture change services as well, really focusing around looking at cognitive behavioural um, frameworks and applying those to safety, safety culture change, safety performance improvement. Um, so not so much just like a social focus at that point, but this is going back a little while, probably to the late 2000s now. And uh, then after that, went back to corrections for a while. So managed uh, a couple of teams in one of our medium security prisons here who deliver rehabilitation services and psychological assessment services as well, which uh, then sort of brought me back into to working in safety again, and this time in a regulatory capacity as an inspector of mines. Right, so there's uh, quite a bit of um, diverse experience there and really um, sort of across different aspects of the employee life cycle as well. Um, so that uh, probably puts you in a good position to um, look at psychosocial factors um, in organisations. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that broad experience has been helpful, kind of understanding what the organisational context in terms of psychosocial hazards and what will where, where that will tend to emerge, um, but certainly also understanding what are some of the clinical outcomes or the, the consequences of exposure to those hazards as well and having addressed some of that through clinical work previously too. Mm. Yeah, nice. Um, now, like I mentioned uh, at the, the top, um, you know, DEMAs have been working on some fairly interesting things and, and just a few months ago, um, Dima has published a suite of three codes of practice relating to psychological health and safety. Um, can you get, give us a bit of an understanding uh, about what some of the drivers behind the, to the decision uh, to publish those codes when you did? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's probably a bit of historical context there as well. So Demers published its first psychosocial code back in 2019. Um, which was the Mentally Healthy Workplaces FIFO Code of Practice for the resource and construction industries. Um, that was largely driven at the time by the outcomes of the Jacobs Report, or recommendations from the Jacobs Report, um, which came out of the parliamentary inquiry into FIFO suicide. Um, so that, I think at the time, was probably one of the first um, psychosocial codes of practice published in Australia. Um, and from there, that that code related specifically to mining operations and fell under the Mine Safety Inspection Act. Um, so then there was a, an impetus to look at well, what would that look like for general industries? What would that look like um, for those businesses that fall under the Occupational Health and Safety Act as well? So the development work started there. Um, so I suppose the the decision to publish earlier this year is an outcome of quite a lot of work that went in over the couple of years previous in the development of those codes. So when they when they were approved by the minister, when they were the gazetted, um, was just prior to uh, the Work Health Safety Act being proclaimed as well. Um, and so what that meant was those codes were then quite quickly uh, approved again by the minister under the Work Health Safety Act and have now been gazetted as well. So um, we now have those three codes of practice which line up with current legislation um, and the, the impetus behind it being to ensure that we have a robust system from our regulations um, and our, our legislation right through our codes of practice that provide guidance to employers and to workplaces across the state. That's a great, concise uh, explanation of the history. Um, well, every now and again, we do hear uh, or see on LinkedIn in particular that the New South Wales regulator really loves saying, hey, we've got the first code of practice for uh, psychosocial risks. Uh, I do like to remind them when I see that, that actually, no, we did have one in 2018 for FIFO. Uh, yes, theirs is the first industry agnostic one, but you know, the first code of practice was actually uh, the, the WA one. Um, any uh, indication of how well that first code of practice from 2018 for FIFO and construction, how well that's been adopted by um, companies in that industry? Yeah, so uh, I mean, look, my area of work and regulation is my, the mining industry specifically. So I spent quite a bit of time since 2019 really reinforcing what, what the framework around psychosocial risk management is as it's reflected in that code of practice. 
Um, and I would say that more recently, there's been a lot more impetus put behind that with a lot of the attention, the community attention that's focused around psychosocial hazards, um, particularly in relation to gendered violence. So I think there was a, a steady uptake initially, um, and then we've seen much more progression more recently in relation to that as well. Yeah, Royal Commission will do that generally, like put more of a, <laughs> a yes, focus. Yes, yeah, a lot of media attention, parliamentary inquiry, uh, those yeah. sorts of things are brilliant for driving change in action, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. The reputational risk is very real at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I guess moving on to the, the new codes of practice that have, have more recently been published. So um, you've published three. Can you give our listeners just a, a bit of an introduction to each of those three codes? Yeah, absolutely, Joel. And look, I assume your listeners are probably quite familiar with what the, the legislative framework actually looks like, but I suppose just for a bit of context there, we have our Work Health Safety Act now as the, the head or the legislation um, in terms of workplace safety in the state, and then we have three sets of regulations that sit below that as well. Um, much of the content in those regulations is, is replicated, um, but then we have regulations specific to mining and then regulations specific to petroleum and geothermal. Um, operations as well. So then the codes of practice sit at a, another level down effectively um, and those codes of practice then provide general practical guidance for how um, employers, workplaces can actually meet their obligations under the Act and the regulations. The, um, the three codes themselves, I would say it's probably helpful to think in terms of the psychosocial hazards in the workplace code really sitting at the top and providing an overarching framework for how a risk-based approach or methodology to the management of psychosocial hazards can be adopted and implemented within a business um, and outlining what the obligations are in relation to that. Then the two other codes, so the, uh, the Workplace Behaviours Code and the Violence and Aggression in the Workplace Code, focusing on specific areas of psychosocial hazards or specific categories that um, we know uh, have high potential um, to cause psychological harm and are relatively, the, the, the likelihood of exposure is relatively um, high in across industries and a number of different workplaces as well. Um, and probably key difference between the Workplace Behaviours Code and the Violence and Aggression Code, because there is a lot of overlap obviously, is that the Violence and Aggression Code of Practices particularly focused on looking at practical strategies to manage external uh, sources of risk to workers, so where the, uh, the the risk of workplace violence and aggression may be coming from customers or clients or external persons rather than from uh, within um, workers of the business itself. Yeah, and that was um, my understanding of the, the difference between them was one was for sort of internal, um, interpersonal um, factors and, and the other was, yeah, how, how do our, um, our employees interact with third parties, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you probably answered uh, the next question that I had for you, which was, um, you know, why was there a decision made to publish three separate codes of practice rather than, than one? Uh, I guess it's probably similar um, if we think about ISO 45001, for example, which is a standard for occupational health and safety management systems, and then 45003 being specific to how do we manage psychosocial hazards because there are, you know, specific nuances with how you do that. Um so it sounds like you've taken a similar path with having like a, um, a broader um, code, which is the management of psychosocial hazards, and then you've got, you know, specific codes underneath that for specific identified hazards. Yeah, absolutely. And look, the, the intent behind that is to take a risk-focused approach as well. So we know that there are um, particular uh, categories of psychosocial hazards that are either more prevalent in certain industries or more likely to cause harm or serious harm, then the, the codes of practice have been designed to address that or provide guidance in relation to that. Um, but certainly part of the intent in having those three individual codes of practice is so that there is a really robust framework that, are quite, that can be applied quite broadly across industries um, and can ensure that it, no matter what the scope of a business or size of its operations, there are practical elements that can actually be um, identified through those codes that would be relevant to the operations of that particular business or workplace as well. So uh, ensuring that outside of the obligations of the legislation itself and the regulations, that there is that practical information, practical guidance that employers can use as well. Okay, yeah, 
Uh, I'm interested to know, I guess, um, from Dima's perspective, how each of the codes relate to each other. Um, yeah, is does one like override another, or are they all complementary? They, they certainly are intended to be complementary, and there's yeah, as you read through the contents of the codes, there is quite a bit of overlap in terms of coverage as well. Um, as mentioned, the, the psychosocial hazards code really does cover off quite broadly, so it'll identify the the, the common or the well known and established psychosocial hazards and risk factors um, that would be common to workplaces broadly, and then looks at what a, a system of risk assessment and risk management would actually look like in the context of the obligations around the Act. Um, then as we go into the two other codes of practice, they're not subsidiary to the Psychosocial Hazards Code. They are intended to be complementary, but some will be more relevant to, to particular workplaces as well. Um, and certainly while the, uh, the Workplace Behaviours Code would be relevant to most workplaces because there'll be those interpersonal interactions in every workplace, um, there may be some businesses, um, some workplaces, where those external sources of violence and aggression are, are, are more likely as well or more foreseeable. So those organisations would also be picking up the content from the uh, Workplace Violence and Aggression Code of Practice as well. Yeah, from Dima's perspective, um, I mean, you'd have some data on this. What, what industries do you think that those um, specific codes would have um, more relevance for because of the likely hazard exposure? Yes, in terms of workplace violence and aggression, there are certainly industries that are more impacted and it tends to be industries that have more client facing or customer service um, facing functions. Um, so some examples of that are your sort of nursing, home care, community care uh, industries or service mm -hmm. providers um, where people are perhaps more likely to be working alone, working in uh, clients or customers' home locations as well. So there's, in that sense, less um, physical control over the workplace itself. Um, and there's certainly some, um, there's some other venues or workplaces where we have interacting risks. So um, bars and nightclubs, for example, where you have interacting risks around uh, alcohol consumption. Um, and certainly if, if I look at it in our context or mining context as well, um, we often look at the incidence of workplace and aggression in customer facing environments like in a mining village. We have site support service workers whose risk profile um, whether in a retail or a customer service environment in the camp is going to be much different to other mine workers who are operating in, in that same location or in that same environment as well. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Mm. Um, so I guess we're, I'm interested to know, um, you know, the, there's lots of different um, groupings of psychosocial hazards or, or risk profiles that you could have selected to target those codes of practice. So, um, initially looking at the violence and aggression code, why did you choose that um, that particular um, factor? Primarily from a risk base. So looking at the, the, the likelihood of exposure, particularly some of those high risk industries, obviously, but then the consequences of exposure to those hazards as well. So when we're talking about um, specific behaviours like physical violence and assault, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sexual assault as well, so sexual violence, and then other forms of threats, intimidation, those sorts of things, and, and including sexual harassment as well. Um, the consequence of worker exposure to those is quite significant in terms of the, the, the impact, the potential injury outcomes, um, both in terms of psychological injury and physical injury, obviously, in some cases as well. So obviously very serious matters with very serious potential consequences. Um, hence the impetus behind ensuring that there's that practical framework there that employers can actually um, utilise to assess their level of risk and exposure and then implement effective controls in that context as well. Yeah, and I would imagine that it's um, probably more difficult um, to, as an employer to understand how to manage that kind of risk when you are talking about customer service. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And look, some organisations, large, large organisations, so you think about the risks associated maybe with, uh, say, large hospitals who are providing a customer-facing service and at times providing a service to people who might be distressed and where there might be more opportunities for um, aggression hazards to arise as well, um, are potentially also going to be quite familiar with some of those risks and, and understand what some of the associated controls would be and potentially well-resourced to address those controls as well. But there might be smaller retail environments like 
mentioned before, we're talking about sort of um, bars and hospitality outlets who may not be as familiar with the risks involved or not necessarily as familiar with the health and safety context, the risk assessment process, the design of controls. So ensuring that there's coverage across those different types of workplaces is really important as well. Yeah, and I mean, certainly, you know, women that I know who have worked in, in hospitality, whether that's bars or restaurants or, or whatever that is, um, have a lot of the time experienced those situations where they've been sexually harassed by a customer, um, often by a regular customer um, who takes a shine to them, if we want to use that kind of language, um, and their um, employer essentially tells them just to suck it up and deal with it, um, which obviously, um, you know, from a um, a duties perspective, um, they're not they're not um, providing the duty of care that um, that their their employee is owed in that situation. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I think that part of the benefit of having very clear codes of practice that specifically address some of those risks, and and certainly the workplace uh, violence and aggression code does talk to this, um, and obviously the workplace behaviours code talks to this as well, is putting information out there that can actually start to challenge that notion that in certain industry sectors or in certain workplaces, there should be an expectation that you'll be experiencing or be exposed to some of those behaviours. The reality is that in a workplace, any workplace, any exposure to those inappropriate behaviours is unacceptable. Um, and if we're clear, really clearly identifying calling out what those behaviours are and pushing that obligation, an employer has to provide a, a safe workplace that's um, free of psychological hazards as well as physical hazards to the extent that it can be, that's really important in terms of addressing some of those industry cultural issues as well, I think. Um, and it is always concerning when we go out to a workplace, and, and I, I experience this in mining workplaces as well, we go out, we talk to workers, and the feedback that we get is, well, yeah, I, I do get exposed to the, some of those things, so abusive language or um, sexually inappropriate comments, but I expect that it's kind of part of the job, um, and, and obviously it shouldn't be considered that way. No, and not in the same way as um, if you're a paramedic, you're going to be exposed to trauma. That's a different, um, I guess it's sort of the same argument, but it, it actually applies when you're talking to a paramedic that, yes, you are actually going to be in, in situations where there's a lot of trauma, um, but that is actually a function of the role, whereas being sexually harassed isn't a function of the role and shouldn't be framed that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think if you look at the paramedic example, then it's absolutely foreseeable that you're going to be exposed to potentially traumatic events because that, that's literally the nature of your role. Um, we still have an obligation as an employer of a paramedic to address that, to have risk assessed it, to have controls in place to the extent that we can. But as you say, boss, there's an expectation there and it is foreseeable. It, that shouldn't be an expectation across, um, across all industries that you would be exposed to those inappropriate behaviours particularly. Yep. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see um, as these codes are adopted and uh, companies mature in how they uh, understand these risks. Um, yeah, what changes that does actually make in in cultural uh, in the culture of these organisations, right? Which typically are male dominated. Yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously, there's been a lot of focus on those sorts of issues, particularly in the context of gendered violence in the mining industry um, recently in WA as well. Yeah, it is. Um, it does seem to be probably in the top three uh, priorities for most mining organisations at the moment. Uh, yeah. Anything around gendered violence, absolutely. Um, so, tell us, Bryce. Um, the workplace behaviour code of practice focuses primarily on you know interpersonal actions between colleagues. Um, why was that decided to be a focus area rather than say job design style hazards like work overload or role ambiguity? I think, again, in this context, the focus on inappropriate workplace behaviours and the provision of guidance specific to that is it's taking a risk focus um, in terms of looking at the likelihood of exposure in organisations broadly and then also the consequence of that exposure. Um, hence separating that out and ensuring that there's a code specific to some of those issues and certainly in the context of what we're talking about a, a lot with, um, with employers of PCBUs, um, sexual harassment risk, bullying risk, um, they are, there's obviously the significant foreseeability that those sorts of hazards are going to arise in, uh, in across a broad range of organisations. 
Um, and the other thing that we certainly consider there is that when we start to consider some of those psychosocial risk factors, so particularly in terms of things like your job demands, for example, part of the intent of the psychosocial hazards in the workplace code is to address those um, as well and provide information around how they might be risk assessed, what sort of controls or system of controls would be beneficial to actually address those risk factors um, and what sort of controls are appropriate to address those sort of risk factors in addition to looking at those behavioural hazards as well. Yeah, so I'd imagine, uh, you know, under the primary code around psychosocial hazards, then, you know, there's more of a focus around work design and then you've got the specific run around the workplace behaviours. Exactly right, exactly right. And if we, we sort of start to look at those um, risk factors a little bit more broadly in terms of things like job demands or role clarity, um, levels of control and autonomy in work, um, the reward and recognition in the workplace, levels of supervisory support, then what the codes of practice seek to do is identify what those risk factors are, what they can contribute to as well, and mm -hmm. really looking at those risk factors, particularly in terms of being prime candidates for preventative controls. So if we can use work design or job design controls, then we can actually go a long way to looking at how we can, um, perhaps if not eliminate, at least significantly reduce the likelihood of exposure which might then set up that potential for psychological harm down the track. Yeah, it's definitely something that we've um, spoken about with the previous guest, Karen Maher, about how, um, you know, uh, inappropriate workplace behaviour, whether that's bullying and harassment or sexual harassment, um, can often be a symptom of poorly designed work. So work overload or, you know, poor supervisory support or colleague support, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So the behaviours are, yeah, symptomatic of, of uh, poor work. Yeah, and it's certainly something in terms of having a code that specifically looks at workplace behaviour. It is about reinforcing that notion that these are these are complex psychosocial hazards. They don't stem from an individual. So that the person who might be perpetrating the behaviour is never the hazard. The hazard is what we're actually looking at in terms of that interaction of factors that actually create or set up the likelihood for that hazard, that exposure to actually occur. So uh, an effective risk-based system is going to look at understanding what those contributing factors are and then establishing controls specific to those so that we're actually less likely to expose someone to that bullying hazard in the first instance. Yeah, I'm um, particularly interested to see how this gets communicated down to the employee level. Obviously, under duty of care, it's not just the employer, but also the employees that have a responsibility to make sure that they're not harming uh, their fellow, their colleagues. Um, and so if it's their behaviour which is causing harm, then they have a obviously a responsibility to think about their behaviour and the consequences of that. So interesting to see how that's communicated down to that level and uh, whether that changes people's behaviours, taking more of a health and safety lens to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we are starting to see that more and more now, particularly if I think of it in the context of mining operations, where they've, they've had a little bit more lead time in terms of having a specific code of practice for their the scope of their operations for a while now and really considering this not as an HR issue and uh, when a complaint of let's say sexual harassment is made then that's something that we're going to consider through an HR lens and we're going to look at substantiating and then we're going to take action against an individual um, but rather starting to look at this also from a health and safety perspective and understanding well, what might have actually contributed to the likelihood of that exposure in the first instance, whether or not um, the specific incidents that are reported can actually be substantiated or not. And then considering, well, what do we need to do differently as an organisation at an organisational level? And what do we need to communicate to our employees as well so that they understand how this fits in the context of um, their social obligations and their health and safety obligations? Yeah, and I'd imagine, um, you know, knowing what I do about mining companies here, um, that, you know, they're going to be uh, making this very clear that it's unacceptable from a health and safety perspective if there's physical health and safety infringements at an employee level where they knowingly, you know, work around um, things that are there for their physical protection, then uh, they can be dismissed pretty quickly. Um, and we did see, obviously, with the parliamentary inquiry into a certain miner here that they did reveal that I think there was about 48 terminations because of um, sexual harassment. So, um, yes, I think when when miners start thinking about this, as they obviously are from a health and safety lens, then they're going to be moving swifter to move those people out of the organisation if they've knowingly, you know, failed in their own individual duty of care to their colleagues. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and certainly there are um, there are those IR industrial relations focused outcomes, um, and and where those standards are set set well and um, they're communicated effectively, they're enforced. Then we would expect to see those disciplinary outcomes as well. Um, but I suppose the other thing that I'd highlight there is that yeah, in addition to seeing the disciplinary outcomes and seeing that as evidence that um, a PCBU is taking their obligation seriously. There should also be those health and safety outcomes. So, as you're saying, Jason, if we'd expect that um, if a, a, an employee breaches a, a safety rule, um, that there would be some sort of disciplinary outcome there, we would also expect that the PCBU would have undertaken a thorough investigation and looked at well, what are the what are the systems of work focused issues or the plant and equipment focused issues that we actually need to rectify so we don't have similar incidents again in the future. And that's really what we need to see in relation to psychosocial hazards as well. So disciplinary outcomes, yes, but also what, what rectifications are we making? What are we doing to prevent recurrence in terms of the organisational work environment factors as well? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I think things, um, well, health, health and safety understand the concept of just culture and seeing um, individual behaviour as a symptom potentially of systemic issues. Um, so it'll be uh, yeah, good to see that followed up the changes, get to the root cause. Really loved Karen Ma's example. Um, we ended up creating a video clip on uh, Flourish uh, LinkedIn, and it was uh, thirsty bullies. Yeah. <laughs> Found that dehydration was linked to bullying behaviour, and so by improving hydration, it actually reduced bullying uh, incidents. So uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting when you start putting a systemic lens in and going, what's driving this behaviour? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, something significant that's happened since your codes of practice were published is that um, the amendments to the model WHS regulations have been published um, with a specific amendment relating to um, psychosocial risk management. Um, so eventually, I guess, um, there will be an expectation that Western Australia will adopt those amendments um, into our WHS regulations. Um, will the codes of practice be revised sort of once that has happened? I think it would probably depend on the the outcomes of that parliamentary process in terms of what Western Australia ultimately adopts in relation to psychosocial regulation. Um, if and whether or not those new regulations require that more information or different information is actually included in those codes of practice. Um, so certainly the option is obviously there to, to update those codes. Um, and at the moment, actually, we're working through the process of reviewing and updating the um, Mentally Healthy Workplaces FIFO code of practice to bring it in line with the current legislation as well. Um, so the, it will definitely be an option. It would be something to consider. But say, Joel, ultimately, it's going to be determined by what's act, what the content of those psychosocial regulations ends up being. Yeah. And do you have any insights that you're able to share with our listeners into um, what that process looks like for adopting um, those amendments in Western Australia? Yeah. So it, it's primarily a parliamentary process, obviously, in terms of adopting amendments to existing legislation, subsidiary legislation. Um, but there's certainly a process of communication there between the, the regulator um, and the responsible minister as well. Um, there would be parliamentary drafts people who would be engaged to actually draft those amendments on the basis of that those instructions from the minister. Um, and then there would you typically be some sort of review through that process as well once those that draft has actually been established um, and then obviously goes through the parliamentary process of those amendments actually being adopted into the regulations as well. Um, so in, in terms of timeframes for that process, um, I, I can't provide any insight into that in terms of when it will actually occur at this stage, um, but that process would certainly be consistent with what we'd expect to see around amendments to legislation generally as well. Yeah, and given that the, the WHS Act has only just been introduced into Western Australia, do you think that that will, um, well, yeah, I mean, is, is that more likely to accelerate that process or do you think that there will be more of a, um, a desire to have a bit of a lag before adopting the amendments? 
I think it's probably hard to say at this stage. I think in terms of what we what we do know and what we do see, there's certainly a real impetus behind addressing psychosocial hazards in WA workplaces at the moment. We're certainly seeing a lot of action taken. Um, the, the publication of the codes of practice, the guidance information that's being produced, the level of activity in that area, probably all good examples of that, and a lot of the cross-agency work that's being done, um, including the, the Mars program, um, which the government had announced uh, recently as well. All of those are probably good examples of the level of focus at different levels of, of government in terms of these these sorts of issues at the moment. Yeah, and the I mean the duties in the Act don't change. You know, and the regulations overwhelmingly say treat psychosocial hazards in the same way that you treat other hazards. Um, so it's probably nothing enormously groundbreaking there. There's just I guess those um, those couple of could say more prescriptive um, elements of it where it's saying think about the, you know, the um, severity, frequency and duration of exposure and the um, the cumulative exposure of, you know, a, a cluster of hazards rather than looking at them as sort of single um, standalone hazards. Yeah, yeah, exactly right, Joel. And it, it is about that level of prescription in terms of how to, how to address or how to manage um, those sorts of considerations in a workplace. Um, I think in the mining context, we're probably fortunate because our mining regulations do give us additional levels of prescriptions around, for example, a mine safety management system and what the requirements there are, the level of risk assessment that has to be undertaken and what needs to be assessed. Um, it doesn't reference psychosocial hazards specifically, but as you're saying, um, we, we know that health generally now refers to physical and psychological health in the West Australian legislation, so that any hazard that exists in an operation that may impact psychological health or cause psychological harm needs to be considered in exactly the same way as any other hazard as well. So the, those obligations, as you say, they're already there, they already exist. The, the new Act and regulations certainly provides a good level of prescription in relation to what, uh, what PCB is you need to do to assess and address those sorts of considerations and further prescription obviously would um, perhaps provide more concrete information in terms of what those workplaces need to do in addition. Mm. Is um, Bill Johnston the, um, the minister responsible? Um, yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, he's the yeah. He's got a number of portfolios there, but, uh, but certainly mines is one of them. Yeah, because I, I do recall um, it would have been a couple of years ago when um, they were talking about WA joining the Model um, uh, Workplace Health and Safety Act, uh, adopting that, uh, that, yeah, he did speak to psychosocial risks as one of the things um, that they were looking forward to, you know, uh, maturing as, as a thing. So if the ministers are responsible for asking for drafts to be made, um, he's, uh, he's been cited publicly saying that this is a key thing that we want to include. So there will be adoption, let's call it. I'm, I'm calling it. <laughs> Demons doesn't have to confirm or deny. It's cool. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, hey, Bryce. watch this space sort of answer from me, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as expected, Bryce. You did well. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, Bryce, it's been actually really good conversation with you. And I say actually not because I'm surprised. But, Rude. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that was really, really well articulated. I think um, you've probably cleared up a number of things and questions that, you know, some of our listeners may have had. Um, one question we do like to ask all of our guests, uh, including those from regulators, is uh, if you were to look into the future, what would your hopes for the future of workplace mental health be? Yeah, so I, I guess consistent with some of what we've been talking today, I think ideally, the future would look like a, a worker, any person being able to go into their workplace and be pretty confident they're not going to be exposed to, to any form of harm or suffer any kind of harm, whether that's physical or psychological. Um, and I know in the context of the work that we do in mind safety, for example, I think we, we go out, we, we talk to employers and there's still a lot of conflation between what is a mental health or a psychosocial consideration and what are employee wellbeing initiatives. So I think when we go out, we talk about your strategic approach and we're still hearing things like, well, we give our, um, our employees access to optional yoga sessions and look at the, the care packages we provide to people when they arrive in the business and those sorts of things. They're really nice things, but they're, they're not controls for psychosocial hazard exposure. And to look into the future and see that that's really well understood 
and that employers know what their obligations are and they're taking a really risk-based approach to understanding the psychosocial risk file and looking at preventative controls that are actually going to prevent people from being exposed to the hazard and controls that aren't just there to address after there's been an exposure to a hazard or after there's been harm to health, um, that the energy is being invested up front in prevention. Um, I, I think that's where we need to get to. Yeah, and we'd love to see that to come to fruition sooner rather than later. Um, but, yeah, actually just to that point, uh, I was on a webinar earlier this week and there was a question from the audience um, who was asking about psychosocial risk assessment and uh, yeah, conflating uh, the uh, assessment of psychosocial risks with well-being, like uh, employee well-being. And so the, there seems to be confusion still about, oh, so we're supposed to measure for like depression and anxiety in our population rather than going, no, we need to assess for the foreseeable uh, or we need to assess the hazards uh, that are associated with their role and the foreseeable risk um, or all the risk associated with those has that hazard exposure. So uh, I think, yeah, there's definitely uh, further uh, communication around wellbeing measurement versus psychosocial hazard measurement. Yeah, absolutely would agree with that. All right, last question for you today, Bryce. Um, do you have any words of advice for listeners who are interested in working in the field of psych health and safety? Yeah, so I think uh, particularly in West Australian context, there's obviously a lot of energy and a lot of focus on this area at the moment. So if there is interest there, it's a really good time to be looking at opportunities. Um, I think particularly for those who do have that good level of experience and depth of knowledge around um, psychological practice, either in organisational context or clinical context, there's, there's a need within industry generally to have that, that level of understanding and knowledge actually built up um, so that there is a, a great awareness or greater ability to communicate what, what these obligations and what these needs are in terms of psychosocial risk um, particularly. So I think those who do have the, 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 the knowledge, the, the foundations around that and a really good ability to communicate out or to um, make practical sense of what that might look like in relation to what can be quite complex hazards and complex considerations, um, there's lots of opportunities out there. Yeah, I think that's a great point um, in being able to communicate what is a, you know, a complex um, scientific concept um, and communicating that in, in language and models and sort of frameworks that are understandable to, to the audience um, in question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Bryce, um, thank you again for, um, you know, going through all the rigours of trying to get permission to come on to the podcast. We really appreciate the effort that all our regulators make to come on the podcast because it's a bit more difficult than a lot of our other guests. So I appreciate that and appreciate, um, yeah, your, again, articulation of the codes and, and what they mean for West Australians. No, thank you both. It's been a pleasure. Terrific. Well, uh, listen, that brings us to the end of the episode. So just remember, if you do want to watch the videos of these conversations uh, rather than listen to the podcast, then you can check that out on the Flourish DX YouTube page. Um, we also take some of the best clips uh, from this and put that on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page if you want to follow that. Um, and while you're over on LinkedIn, Joelle and I frequent there way more than what we probably should as I'm procrastinating generally. Mm. Um, so uh, actually the other day when I was doing my webinar, um, someone connected with me and wrote me a message and I was writing back to her during the webinar, which she thought was amazing. Um, so, yes. Classic. That's a classic Jason move classic right Jason. there. Yeah, yeah. So um, even during live webinars, don't be afraid to like hit me up on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, like I said, I probably shouldn't be on there as much as I am. Um, but, yeah, uh, hit us up and we'd love to continue the conversation there. Uh, but that brings us to the end. Uh, we'll catch you next episode. You've been listening to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on psychological injury prevention, follow Flourish DX on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast at www.psychhealthandsafety.com.